Hello, just friends. This is Fidel Master Valery Lewolf, and welcome to today's lecture on the backwards pause. As I have shown in the previous lectures, the backwards pause is generally a weakness. It's considered to be one because often it reduces the activity of uh, the player, who, of, of the activity of the pieces, the player who has that weakness, and most importantly, it becomes a constant target on which uh, the player, uh, the, the other, the opposite player, can actually attack. Nevertheless, there are certain occasions, like for example in the Sveshnikov variation in the Sicilian, or for example in the in some lines in the Grunthold and the King's Indian, in which a backwards pawn might actually turn out to be a strength in the position than more like a weakness. It's something that not that many people really believe in, but uh, that's what I that, that here's where I would like to say that uh, um, very often on many of the on many occasions generally the backwards pawn might actually turn out to be a strength we just need to know how we can turn out to be uh, to, to transform such kind of a weakness into a strength the game which we'll be looking at was played between two very strong grandmasters of the past Lubomir Lobovic uh, a uh, Yugoslavian grandmaster who was uh, one of the strongest grandmasters in the in the 1970s and uh, even even nowadays he remains one of the most experienced players and Vladimir Kramnik probably most of you have actually heard about Vladimir Kramnik the f official 14th world champion and of course great player of, 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 our, of our time, the modern days. So I believe that this game is a unique example of um, utilizing the strength of a backwards pawn and especially um, it shows quite instructively how the backwards pawn may not be a weakness. So let's take a look at the game. Uh, Lubovic had the white pieces and he basically started with the move of uh, d4 after which Kramnik played the move of knight f6 and after uh, c4, e6, knight c3 and bishop b4 we got the Nimzo Indian defense. Usually black's idea in this opening is to exchange in the c3 which will later on give him the possibility to exploit white's weaknesses which are the c3 and c4 pawns. On the other hand uh, white can utilize that time to exploit his pair of bishops advantage and probably transfer his ideas in the center where he can get stronger center and eventually powerful control. Anyway, after bishop b4 in the game, white played the line with queen c2, which is a smart line, because now in case black's bishop takes in c3, white may not need to double his pawns, but he can actually recapture with the queen instead. And here black castles short. Castles short and a3. Now, basically this move of a3 is uh, uh, pretty interesting. I have different opinion about that though and this is that every time when black plays a3 no matter that he's you know forcing the exchange of the um, of the dollar squared bishop that black is having still that's a kind of waste of a tempo and to a certain extent the move of pawn up to a3 I wouldn't say that this really loses that much time or anything like that it's just that I would like to say that this move I mean in particular the continuation of pawn to the a3 may help black to gain this one single tempo and after the exchange of the bishop or bishop x to c3 queen x to c3 acquire a very good control of the center and use the time to open up the center develop his pieces faster and uh, to a certain extent neutralize the power of the white pair of bishops so anyway after the exchange and recapture black played here the move of pawn to b6 and after white played the move of bishop to g5, black played d6. Now in this line, as in many occasions when black plays the Nimzo Indian or the Queen Indian, his intention is to have a decent control of the e4 square. The reason why white plays the bishop on g5 is because he wants to pin on that knight and make it more difficult for black to acquire the control of that e4 square. And in this case, black played d6. Now I believe this is a pretty interesting um, decision but since the main lines uh, actually that happen in this position are either bishop to b7 with which black just develops the bishop to control e4 or uh, the other line is pawn up to c5 intending to add some further pressure against white's d4 pawn or even 
the move of bishop to a6, with which black can probably add some kind of pressure against white's c4 pawn, which seems to be kind of interesting. The line of d6 has its own ideas, however. The main plan of black putting his own pawn on d6 is to get ready and probably place his own knight on d7, after which there could be, there could be an idea after knight b to d7 for black to come out with a move like bishop to b7, and later on, this kind of a pawn's formation might actually help block to play e6 to e5 very successfully. So like a breakthrough in the center like this might be especially helpful and after, let's say, some exchanges or something similar, black might get a lot of space and powerful activities down there. Anyway, after d6 in the game, white played the move of f3. The move f3 is very easy to understand. Another alternative is e3, but now what white wants is to get the ability to play e4 in one move, which is going to set him up with three paws put in or very close to the center, which is certainly something very helpful and quite quite essential. By having the pa these paws out there, like c4, d4, and e4, white is not only going to control a lot of space and uh, um, squares around, but also he's going to have uh, you know possibilities to bring bishop on the d3 and get some other resources, helpful resources, towards that side of the board. So that was his main idea, that was white's main possibility. Okay, after, as soon as white played this variation with f3, black decided to come up with knight b to d7, and white went through with the line of e4. Once e4 is played, basically white's idea is to continue the idea, the, the place plan with uh, the most important bishop up to the d3, and I suppose as soon as that happens, truly, I consider that white will have not only a very decent control around the center area, but also he'll be having excellent possibilities out there um, as a hall. So having more space is certainly very important in similar positions. That influence everything, and, uh, control of the of the different squares, possibilities, and uh, even the the resources that White is going to get. So I suppose right now, in general, White wants to get everything as much as it's possible. So after the move of f3 and possibly e4, Black played c5. When the opponent isn't that well prepared. It is most important for you to begin a kind of a, a counterattack around, around the center. By playing the move of pawn to c5, what black gets is the actual ability to attack directly against white's pawn on the d4, and therefore make it really difficult and harder for white to sustain his position towards the center area. So this is something really important and very powerful. As soon as that actually, uh, at this, as this variation actually happens, now white has a little bit of an issue. The problem is mostly connected with his d4 pawn, and it's not so easy, or let's say, so nice for him to manage his, his ideas. Let's take a look and see how the game develops after that. So after black played the move of c5, white d dicks to c5, and black simply recaptured with b dicks c5. Everything is now under command. Uh, what we now find, however, is that there is a little issue that maybe black would try to resolve. The little bit of issue here is actually the pawn on the d6 square that black might feel uh, like a little bit of a problem in this position. For example, in case of rook to d1 adding further pressure against this pawn and so on, it seems like black will be experiencing a little bit of a, of a trouble with this pawn which will be attacked. Maybe white can set up the, you know, like for example, his queen or something against it and that's not, you know, that's not so good in the way it goes. So, um, basically after b to c5, the main question that you might have right now is why did Kramnik really go on that line? I mean, knowing that in this position he's going to receive this type of a weakness. Why did he ever actually play this way? What, why did you want that? And what we find after b to c5 is that he made this with the main idea to quickly develop the pieces. First he made h6 to neutralize the bishop. And what he wants to achieve right now is the, oppor the opportunity to protect the d6 pawn and use the strength of this.
Now, probably one of your main questions that you will be having here is how could D6 be a strength in that position? It more or less looks like a, a really, really bad weakness sound there, which can be easily attacked by white. On the first side, it looks this way. But if we think about it more precisely, more carefully, we'll actually find that this isn't such a bad weakness. It isn't so weak overall. So right now, after knight x f6 and long side castling, we have a very interesting position. Generally, I believe that uh, after b x to c, the pawn structure is is very special. But when white, uh, you know, when white decided to um, come out with the long castles, in my opinion, he gets the real weak wing side and eventually black has the ability to utilize this plan neutralize white's attacks in the d5 on the d6 and most importantly carry on with his own counter attack against the white queen side and especially the b2 pawn which seems to be pretty weak down there what should be made here from blocks so that he gets you know better and more up, more important opportunities is there something that he needs to do or he needs to try so that he gets everything under um, under the command well there are a couple of things that maybe he would like to do but all that i want to say is that in this very moment white already uses to uh, lose all of his threats and anything that he was he was making up to that point and it's really interesting to to to, to see how the game developed after long castles and how black managed to utilize his main advantage the first thing that black did in this position was e5 why was this move played easy this move was played because what black wants to do as most is to get this bishop to bring his bishop up to the e6 square by doing that He's going to get an instant opportunity to, um, let's say, set up the, the major piece in connection. And as soon as that happens, probably the B5 could be, the B5 could be really useful uh, in connection to, to his own plans and ideas after. I think that overall, at this moment, Black has everything under the command. Of course, it doesn't turn out to be so easy, you know, like to decide how to, how to play on. But still, this is a position that, uh, in my opinion, already starts to be better for black. Why the g4 and black played rook to b8? From that moment, what we find is that um, when the black rook comes to b8, you know, the activity is going to work with a certain outline. Anytime when a player is playing with a backwards pawn, what is most required in such positions is always to make some kind of an outline. What is generally the outline? The outline is an idea of where the pieces need to stay or where they need to go so that basically they are in connection with, uh, uh, let's say, with, uh, like, uh, with the weakness and maybe in connection to the major plan that one is going to have. So right now the major question that basically comes to the block side is what type of an outline he would like to have so that maybe his, acti his activity or eventually the plans that he has got should to be more, more effective or more important overall. It isn't an easy question to answer, but it's something interesting. After the move of rook b8, white played knight f2. Currently at this point, white starts to be uh, well placed towards that area, and his idea is to maneuver the knight. From f2, white would eventually want to place, play the rook on the d2, and uh, probably maneuver his knight through d1 to e3, from where the white knight will have the ability to control or cover, so I like to say, uh, some of these squares like on the d5 and on the f5, which is certainly something very important. The truth is, however, that Y doesn't have a direct way or, a, a, or an ability to approach the pawn and the d6. So no matter what he has, no matter what type of ideas he has, they're not going to be that fast or not, they're not going to be as, as important simply because Y doesn't have the time. And it's really interesting how the game went after that. So as, I mean, like as soon as uh, this move has been played, I mean, as soon as the move of uh, knight f2 was being played, black played rook to b6. What is the main idea of coming out with rook to b6? It's pretty easy. When the black rook is already on the b6, the protection, the support of the d6 pawn is already set. There is nothing that he needs to be afraid after that, and he is already set. Black is already prepared to come out with some type of a of a decent uh, like uh, the protection of the d6 and possibly considerable threats directly in front of the white queen side. As soon as the move rook to b6 was actually played in this position, white decided to come over with rook d2. 
Um, I would suppose this move was played with an idea to supply that B2 pawn. However, I don't believe that black can really, white can really stop the black major plan with bishop e6, queen c7, rook b8, and further upcoming uh, attacks on the king side, on the, oh, on the on the white queen side, which is where, where is his king, simply because of one reason. White isn't strong enough, white isn't prepared enough, so that he can be in that actual condition to stop black from coming over the queen side area. And in this game, the game the basically the further events developed with a tremendous speed. The first thing that black did in this case was to place the queen on the e7. You know, it's very important anytime when you are playing with a pawn weakness. Now, not that I recommend you or I really uh, suggest you to play with a pawn weakness, but anytime when it happens that you've got to play, you have got to play with a pawn weakness just because there is nothing else as an alternative. Remember that the best thing to do in similar situations, the best idea to start with, is to put the piece around and try to make sure that your opponent has less possibilities, or let's say it, uh, less opportunities to directly attack against this. So right now this is what black wants, to eventually try and as much as it's possible prevent white from concretely attacking the pawn on the d6. So after queen to e7, now it's pretty clear. Uh, I suppose that White should have continued with playing of h4, though I wouldn't say that uh, his attacks or the possibilities that he has on the king side are really enough. I mean, they seem to be definitely kind of slow right here, and in my opinion, Black's own activity on the queen side should go a lot faster and much more, you know, much more powerful. Nevertheless, that would have been at least a bit more purposeful. In the way it ha which it happened in the game, basically what we find is that um, White doesn't get anything, any kind of compensation or possibilities. And after knight d1 and the move of bishop d6, Black simply develops, getting ready to set up his own rook to the b8, add further pressure against the b2, and leave White without the actual possibility or without the actual capability to stay well and probably even manage or try to make some kind of a counterplay. In reality, it doesn't seem like he's in the condition to make any, any of these, uh, at least up here. So, as soon as bishop d6 was played, why did bishop d3 and now black position the other rook behind? b2 is already the weakness. It's really interesting how the great masters of the, of, of the past or the modern time managed to uh, neutralize their weakness by not allowing the opponent to attack it, by gaining activity. See what black got actually at this point. Before he starts anything else, he managed to make sure that white will have no direct or no concrete opportunity to put pressure or directly attack against this pawn. And that was made only by purposeful moves around. So now when this pawn cannot be attacked, pretty much it, uh, it gives black the strength to control the b-file. It gives him a chance even in later stage to take some of the important squares. Like for example, do you imagine what happens in case a knight can, manage, can reach the d4? So black simply continued with rook f to b8 with the major threats of threat of rook b3. The only way how white can defend against it is through bishop c2. At least now the b3 square is not under control. Now black played queen to b7. A almost every piece apart from the knight is properly set. He doesn't need to be worried about anything. The activity of white is completely taken away, which means that the d6 pawn can never turn out to be a real weakness. The term of a weakness in chess is not so much about uh, used about like say certain pawns or something, but often we use this on purpose to say to to, to outline pieces or pawns that can be attacked. Right now, the pawn on d6 is not really one of these. I don't see how white can take advantage and possibly exploit or attack on this pawn directly. So as soon as the black queen came back to b7, white played rook e1, black played the powerful move of rook to h7. Why did he play such a move? It looks so unnatural. I mean, like, well, why does he just bring, the, uh, bring his own? knight on such a backwards position where it doesn't seem to do anything and it's not useful at all. What's the point of this all? The point of placing the knight back there is very simple and quite easy to find actually, quite easy to see. All that black wants to get is the ability to promote the knight on a better square. And what we care about is not so much where the knight will control more squares from, but we care about another type of a question. Where the knight will be more purposeful from? Because the purposeful position of the knight will actually become most meaningful here. 
That's what Black wants to get. And as soon as Knight H7 was played, the Black Knight actually reached a powerful position within only a few maneuvers. Now, after this next move, White's Knight is actually parking to a very powerful position after Knight H7 to get F7, F8. I mean, E6 and then E4 after the move is after the bishop is moved. But before that, even before this, he decided to care mostly about the activity. So you see, no matter whether you're playing with a pawn weakness or against a pawn weakness, all the same, what matters most is the idea to have your pieces more effective, more important. What black wants right now is to get his queen more efficient on the spot. Because by doing that, he's going to leave white with, uh, with, uh, with less space or less opportunities to uh, you know, utilize his own, his own counterattack on the center or maybe the king side overall. That was especially helpful. And right now, when the black queen comes up to a to the a6 square, everything is just tremendous. Black has everything. Pressure, control, space, Anything that one could ever wish from the black position right now is just available. You know, black has nothing to worry about. Everything is available. And as soon as the black queen came up to the a6 square with the attack against c4, white found himself only in one situation where he can play bishop d3 and cover the c4 pawn. Unfortunately, even that wasn't actually enough to stop the upcoming problems from happening. In what way? Why it wasn't actually enough, enough to stop black's threats? Just because Black doesn't have the time, neither he has the actual ability to do to do that all. So what Black found uh, in this position is that he's in the perfect moment to keep the knight improving. When the mo when the bishop actually moves back to the d7, it finally opens the ways for the Black Knight to reach the key the key critical square in the d4, and either Black can move the knight through g5 to e6 and d4, or through f8 e6 and d4, with which he can utilize this knight as a real monster directly in front of the white position. Sadly, White has no way or particular possibility to oppose against that. So many people would probably ask, okay, how is that possible? I mean, like, it's very it looks very unnatural this knight to really reach this, this, such a square if white is careful. But really, if we look even more carefully, we'll find that white doesn't seem to be having any ways or direct opportunities to stop that from coming. If the knight reaches d4, then d6 will no longer be a weakness. In fact, it, it, might, it might, might be only a strength which will prevent white from attacking. But in reality, there is absolutely nothing that White could do to stop these ideas or the potential activities from coming. As soon as that line has actually has happened, Black's, White's Black seems to be in a perfect condition. And White seems to be wondering how he could save his position. Because in reality, if I must be honest, if that knight reaches the d4 square, White wouldn't be thinking for an advantage any longer. He'll be thinking whether it's possible at all to save the position. And so, uh, okay, after coming up with uh, a knight, a bishop back to the d7, white played bishop f1, and the black knight simply comes up. It's really interesting that during the whole game, white never got a chance or actual possibility to, to make any problems. And just at the moment where he brings the rooks on the, or bring, or the, on the d line so that he can attack d6 possibly, the black knight comes through the e6, and now the main idea is, of course, to reach the to reach the most important, the most valuable d4 square, after which white will seem to be helpless, actually, against the black activity and uh, the general possibility is starting up with rook to b3 or something similar. Really, I don't think how white will help himself or do anything against this. It's amazing. After coming forth in the way with knight e6, white does not have any way or any opportunity to... to you know, change the things or try to, you know, like make some complications. The only thing which he tried to do in here was uh, to attack the d6, but that's, that's just not enough. And as soon as uh, oh, the white knight came up to do e3 square, black already made knight d4. That knight is just a monster out there. White tries to make a similar one, but now after rook b3, white simply resigned because his queen gets trapped. I suppose that the final move of uh, uh, white loses straight away, but now we find that uh, basically, you know, uh, it, the general thing is that this knight on the e5 is simply amazing. It has extraordinary type of a, the type of a, a, like an opportunity and uh, one of the one of the essential things is that even if white plays the better one 
instead of knight d5 if he was going to play king to b1 so that he opens up a flight square for his queen to come backwards to the c1 then even in this case after knight queen after rook b3 queen c1 and knight d4 takes f3 white seems to be losing there is just no way to save the material to prevent the material damages and most of the black threats are just quite simple and very straightforward in the way they go so how did that happen? I mean, most many players will probably ask, is that possible for me to actually allow weakness like that and utilize its strengths? Uh, well, yes, sometimes it is possible, but you should know exactly at which point the weakness, like a weak pawn, a backwards pawn, could be a strength. Right now in this game, Black was capable to utilize its strengths because there was such an well, there was such an opportunity. So here is my suggestion. When you want to recognize whether a pawn weakness could have certain strengths and you know important values in the position, then more, more like more than just weaknesses, my main major recommendation is try to think about whether this pawn may actually help you to control something better. Maybe a square or maybe a file like the B line or maybe something which can actually help you to gain uh, additional control. Now. Black found himself that in after after this type of an exchange and uh, you know letting letting him by himself to stay with this pawn, he wouldn't be experiencing so much of a trouble just because he's getting getting the open open B file and the the most straightforward strategy with which he started as soon as that position actually t took place was to make sure that d6 cannot be longer uh, can, cannot be any longer under a threat or under some kinds of attack and after that of course he started and uh, continued with his activity over the b file and he managed to even made a, make a blockade square of the, um, a blockade piece on the d4 with his knight that completely deprived white of any possibilities or activity through which he can possibly attack against the d6 pawn so the strengths of a pawn weakness are not always and so simply found. You've got to be purposeful and think carefully so that you can find them and eventually be able and utilize those. Very interesting game and quite essential concepts about the play with a backwards pawn and the weakness. What are the strengths of it and how you can use them.